Thank you all for joining in on this webinar. This is our fifth Lunch and Learn webinar. Um, this one's on change orders on public works construction projects. And again, like all of our other Lunch and Learn webinars, it's being presented by Ed Duarte, our construction public works specialist. Um, let me... There we go. Um, so my name is Taylor Bowes. I'm the program administrator for the DBE Supportive Services Program. Um, I'm going to introduce Ed Duarte, your presenter, in just a minute. And some of you might have met him already. Um, and then I'll go over just really briefly uh, what the DBE Supportive Services Program is. But again, hopefully you guys are all pretty familiar with our services already. And then we'll jump right into the presentation. Um, these webinars are only open to firms enrolled in the DBE Supportive Services Program, and they're designed to be pretty brief, broad overviews on each topic. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, I'm going to email the slides to this webinar out to everybody who's enrolled in the DBE Program later today or sometime tomorrow. Um, so don't worry too much about taking notes. Um, and this is also being recorded and will be posted to our website and our YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can use the chat box feature um, so that you don't forget your questions. And then we'll either address them right then or we'll save them and have some time at the end to ask questions. And please don't hesitate to ask any questions. There are no bad questions. We're happy to stay afterwards. Um, Last thing really quick is that, like I said, Ed is um, on our DBE team as our construction public works specialist. So if there's anything you learned during this webinar, if there's something specific to your business you'd like to talk through with Ed, um, feel free to reach out to him and schedule a one-on-one -on -one session after the webinar. Okay, so with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Ed, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? Thank you, Taylor. Uh, good day, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, little workshop on um, change orders and construction contracts for public works. Um, my background is a, a degree in civil engineering and having been, I was a Caltrans bridge engineer for eight years and then I went to work for my father's construction company and continued that company until I retired. Uh, the family's business is still within the family, but uh, our, our focus was uh, probably 95% public works, always as a prime contractor. Uh, we did uh, public works buildings and uh, water and wastewater treatment plant work. Having said that, I can tell you that we've been on, on both sides of the fence because um, uh, as a, as a general contractor doing public works in California, you you either learn and survive or you don't make it. So I guess maybe that's a, a compliment towards us. I'm not so sure, <laughs> but uh, some 35, 36 years later, we're still here. Um, let me talk about, uh, I wanna make some introductory remarks about, about this little webinar. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, in my company also was we did a lot of CM, construction management work, which is for those of you who are familiar with the process, um, we, uh, I'm getting a lot of feedback from somebody outside noise. Anyway, um, having been a, a construction manager for public works agencies, I, as I said, we've seen both sides of the fence. This webinar will be presented from the perspective of the contractor because the DBE program is meant to encourage small business, especially small construction contractors and subcontractors to participate and learn how to navigate the system and earn a contract uh, doing work for a public agency. Uh, so if we could have the next top slide, please.
as um, and pass so, that one too. Do you want? Can I go over DBE supportive services really briefly, and then we'll go into the course okay. of Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, just to make sure everyone on this call is aware of the services we provide, uh, hopefully you're familiar already, but the mission of the DBE Supportive Services Program is to help DBE certified firms uh, be successful in the government marketplace. And like Ed was just mentioning, the program does focus heavily on construction and A&E. Um, that's because a lot of the contracts or projects that have a DBE requirement or goal um, are highway construction or A&E projects. Um, so we have a monthly DBE newsletter that lists upcoming bid opportunities, um, relevant events and workshops coming up for DBEs. We have a DBE spotlight, et cetera, a really good resource. So if you're not receiving that, please let me know and we'll make sure you're on the list. We have these monthly Lunch and Learn webinars. Um, we subscribe to govology.com, which is an online training portal. Um, all the trainings are related to government procurement and they're quite expensive normally, but since we have a subscription, our DBE clients get access to the trainings for free. So if you're interested in that, let me know and I can share our code with you. Um, we have a DBE blog, which is written by Ed. Um, we have contractor workshops throughout the year, one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling. This is our ro most robust service, so you can schedule appointments with Ed. We also have a DBE bid specialist on staff, Liz Brazil. Um, you can schedule ses sessions with her anytime and receive assistance on things like bid submittals, um, bid matching, contract compliance, uh, market research, all of that kind of stuff. And then we also provide assistance with updating or creating business plans. So that's us in a nutshell. And now I'll hand it back over to Ed. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so as I was saying before, this is an overview on the process. Um, the good news about, as I've said in many of my workshops, the good news about public works construction contracts and the contract administration and the project management processes. The good news is, is that it is very consistent. If you work for Caltrans, you won't have problems working for the county of Tulare County. If you do work for the city of Dublin, you'll find working for the city of Oakland has similar processes. When it comes to the construction contracts, they are almost identical. The bad news is it's a very complex process. So for a new firm uh, or, or an emerging firm or a startup firm that wants to get into public works, you need to learn the processes and you need to have a whole bunch of of, of uh, uh, infrastructure in place in order, in order to, to do the work, do the paperwork, and survive. So this, this webinar is to provide the guidelines on how to handle change orders, and it is written from a contractor's perspective. Uh, let me add one more thing there. I hope that possibly in today's attendee, attendees, we do have a couple of you from the CM side or the A&E side. Um, any remarks that I make about the design side, owner side of change orders is not meant to be uh, a, 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 det a detractive type statement. It is simply a fact of life that if you aren't aware of it now, for those of you who are contractors and for those of you who are uh, on the other side, A&E or, or CM, construction management. These construction contracts are not written in favor of the contractor. The, the contractor, I'm sorry, the uh, agency and their attorneys, their, their mission, rightfully so, is to protect the agency from every possible uh, liability issue that might come up. So it's not surprising that these contracts are written in favor of the owner. So having said that, let me move along and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Next slide. The basic premise for, for any construction contract, as I said, it's always the same. The contractual requirements and the general conditions are always defined 
in every project. And those, those bid documents will always have those spelled out. And more specifically, they will have a change order procedure that, and trust me and believe me when I tell you, it is explicit and it covers every possible uh, contingency and every, every possible scenario. That procedure has to be followed exactly. It, and that goes for the owner's rep as well. But from a contractor's perspective, you have no choice, but you must follow the sequence of, of uh, procedures that are, are to be followed. It's always the prime's responsibility to follow the procedure, but it absolutely applies to every subcontractor as well. Next. So some key points to remember. Number one, change orders are a sensitive subject with owners for obvious reasons. They don't want, nobody likes change orders on a construction contract. And these don't, engin, architects and engineers, they don't want them either because any change order that's generated by the contractor that is, uh, has to do with the documents, it will reflect on the inaccuracy of their documents. And if that change order is viewed and judged as having merit and therefore implemented, it doesn't make them look good. And it's one of the big problems we have in the industry. Contrary to co common myth, we contractors do not always want them as well because they dis disrupt the normal flow of work and quite often they delay completion. I know we have all heard the stories and I'll, I'll, I'll quote one that's in the paper every day. The high-speed rail is plagued with cost overruns. Well, let me tell you as someone who's very closely acquainted with that project, one of their big problems is the project was advertised and awarded before they had purchased all of the land. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if the contractor moves on and gets ready to start work and then is told, well, you can't go anywhere because we haven't bought that land yet. They have one change order alone on the HSR in, in Fresno that was $55 million solely because of delays to the work, because the right of work had not, the right of way had not been acquired. Uh, the second example is the huge uh, Trans Bay Transit Center in downtown San Francisco. If you haven't heard or you are not aware, they had four, uh, 12,000 RFIs, requests for information, that have resulted in $180 million in pending claims, i.e. change orders, that the contractors are going after the agency for. Now, I don't know about you, but common sense tells me that at $180 million, they can't all be invalid claims. So the 12,000 RFIs tells me everything. Next, next slide. But as a contractor, it is your obligation to follow the documents as written. So what that means for those of you who are contractors, you need to know your contract. You need to know those plans and specs backwards and forwards. You have to understand your scope of work thoroughly because when you generate a change order request, a COR, it sets in motion a process that is going to be scrutinized to the max for obvious reasons. So be sure that your COR has validity and merit before you go around submitting to the owner's rep that you're going to make a claim for additional compensation. Next. The types of change orders slash claims that typically arise, this doesn't cover every single one, but these are by far the most prevalent in construction contracts. And I'll, give, I'll go down each one. And, and each one will be discussed in more detail after this slide. Number one, the owner wants to change the scope of work. Well, obviously that's the simplest and the most positive scenario. I want you to, we want to add another bay to this warehouse and, uh, and we're willing to pay for it. Value engineering. That's something that doesn't get a lot of attention. And if, up to about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 
you didn't see VE uh, processes in, in public works construction contracts. We saw it in the private sector all the time, but that's where the contractor might propose a more efficient and usually less costly method to build something, uh, a change to the drawings, if you will. A schedule delay, uh, those are due to owner or designer or an outside third party interfering with the work and, and, and impeding progress. Hidden site conditions, they were not apparent during the pre-bid job walk. Inclement weather or acts of God, it's different than a schedule delay because that's caused by other parties. This is something that no one, no human being has uh, a uh, ability to control. And the last one is design or specifications deficiencies that result in the contractor spending extra time and money to resolve. So when a contractor submits one of these, the change order procedure will always have a response to deal with the claim and is quite often not in the contractor's favor. I'm gonna discuss examples of each type, but the emphasis will be on the last example, design deficiencies. The reason being that's a common type of COR claim that is submitted and it is nearly always contested. So the scenarios, as I said, number one, the owner wants a change. So the A&E firm will issue a change directive along with a drawing, a description, and the general and the subs will respond with pricing. After some negotiations, they arrive at a number and that change order is implemented. That's the easy one. That's the one that everybody does like, but unfortunately those, <laughs> those are not always the case. Two, value engineering. The contractor comes up a bit with a better way of building a feature. It usually results in a deductive change order or a credit to the owner. But what, what we have found, and our company has participated a lot in, in these types of scenarios, you need to have an incentive for motivating a contractor to do a VE analysis. And the way you do that is to split the cost savings. I recall a job that we did for a local transit agency that we wound up saving them almost $100,000. And the split that we did was 35% to us and 65% to the owner. 70-30 is a typical uh, cost split uh, savings with the, with the balance, the large the, uh, majority of, of savings going to the owner as it should. But again, common sense tells you that if there's nothing in it for the contractor to just come up with a better way, he simplifies his life by simply saying, I'm going to do the job exactly the way it's shown. And um, I've got the money in to do that. But if you, if you offer a split in the, draw, in the, in the documents, then uh, quite often you get a lot of cost savings. It's a very good feature for owner's reps to put into the specifications. A schedule delay, when that's caused by the owner and designer or not by a third party, it's gonna result in that at the expense of the contractor. There's absolutely no argument to that. Examples include failure to respond in a timely manner to a request for information, an RFI, or failure to procure, procure necessary permits and clearances that were the responsibility of others. And that's high-speed rail is a classic example. Failure of other sub suppliers and utilities that were supposed to be coordinated by the owner or its representatives. Um, what I've seen in, the, in, in, in my 50 years of doing this is PG&E. Everybody <laughs> wants to dogpile on, on somebody that's down and out, but PG&E is one of the worst, least dependable uh, public utilities that you can depend on to bring their power in at the time that it's needed in a, in, a, in a new project. So when the contractor doesn't have coordination on, uh, um, I mean, control of that, it results in delays which cause expense, which they should be entitled to uh, compensation. However, as you'll see in the next slide, that doesn't always happen. Next. Hidden site conditions. This is a classic for remodels. 
you go in and you, 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 you go to do a job walk in a building and nobody opens up the walls. And when you win the project, you, you're going, all you can bid on is what is shown, what's black and white. If it's not on the drawings and not covered in the specs, it's not your responsibility. I don't care what an A&E firm or CM or an owner tells you, that is not the legal position. If it's not in the documents, it's not mine. So it's important in when it's hidden site conditions that anything that the contractor finds, you need to document it, which I'll cover in number six. Inclement weather acts of God, you know, floods, forest fires, uh, and interestingly enough, even strikes are covered under uh, what they call force majeure. Uh, in, uh, these these so-called un, uncontrollable uh, actions that uh, that uh, cause a project to be delayed. Typically, <laughs> the response will be, and the claim will be simply an extension of the contract time. It's quite often compensation for destroyed work, like a forest fire or a flood, uh, should be covered by uh, builder's risk insurance. The last one is the most controversial, design deficiencies. It's always the most common scenario, and unfortunately, it's the most controversial and adversarial. If you're an owner's rep or an owner, you, you don't like this, you don't want this, and I, and, and I, I understand. If, if you're a contractor, uh, I always respond to an owner when they say, well, why didn't you know this? Why didn't you anticipate this? And my answer always is the same. Number one, it's not in the drawings. Number two, your designer has anywhere from four to 12 months or longer to put these plans and specs together. You give us three weeks, two to three weeks to bid the job, and you expect us to take those plans apart and find every single deficiency and 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 tell you this during that three week bid period the the common sense the logic of it 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 tells you that that's simply an impossible task so here's what usually happens the contractor will submit an rfi and might say we've encountered a fuel problem that is not covered in the plans and specs in order to solve it we will need to do the following work which will cause us to incur added expenses time. Please advise on the next course of action. That's your typical wording for the RFI. If the claim is valid and the designer agrees, then you you're, gonna, you're gonna have an approved change order. It's when the designer does not agree and says, well, I'm sorry, but you should have known, or I'm sorry if you refer to paragraph such and such, or if you look at detail on sheet number seven of the drawings, et cetera, then they point out that your claim has no merit. That's why I said earlier, before you submit a claim as you for you, those of you who are contractors, you better make darn sure you are in the right, that you have that you have merit, that the answer is not in the plans and specs. But I can tell you, as a, as a gray-haired old veteran of this process, even when we come up with all of the facts and figures and proof that it is a valid claim, I've run into way too many A&Es that simply don't want to look bad in front of the owner, and they deny the claim because it's their right to deny the claim. And when that happens, then the dispute will uh, cause uh, trigger the next course of action. So in that type of scenario, and the RFI or the CUR are denied, and you as a contractor, you need to do the following. And for you who are in attendance today that are from the A&E or CM side, this this uh, set of instructions, if you will, it will do you good too to follow the same procedure. Number one, 
As soon as a problem in the field is discovered, review the plans and specs again. Make sure it's not already covered. Nothing will kill your credibility faster than submitting a COR and then finding out that the scope is covered in the documents. But once you're confident it's a legitimate issue, you can proceed to the next step. Number two, notify. I have never run across a change order procedure in any of the hundreds and hundreds of agencies we have worked for that didn't have a notification requirement. And it's usually 15 days. And it simply says, the contractor is obligated to, to notify the owner within 15 days of the discovery of the field problem. Failure to do so within the prescribed time limit will kill the claim, not can, it will kill it without recourse, even if it has merit because it's a contractual issue. I'm not an attorney and I'm not pretending to be one, but if it says, if you don't notify the owner in 15 days, the claim is denied, that's pretty clear language that anybody can understand. So that notification is really critical. Number three, you have to quantify. When you submit a CUR, you must describe in detail what you claim is the extra paperwork and the cost, which includes obviously the labor, equipment, materials, and the time necessary as it impacts the schedule to accomplish the work. Again, bearing in mind, keeping in mind that any such claim will be scrutinized to an infinite detail. And for you contractors, do not inflate the pricing because it will become readily apparent. Remember, under the prevailing wage laws, the, the, the labor costs are absolutely unknown to everybody. And the hours that you're claiming it to do the work, they're gonna, be, they're gonna be worked over to the max. So don't inflate pricing, but don't be afraid to ask for everything you have coming. Next. When that's all in place, you have to proceed with the disputed work and document every cost through a daily extra work report. This daily extra work report, it serves the purpose of keeping a daily log of the expenses incurred so that they are not an issue of, delay, of debate later. I really can't emphasize this enough, and this especially applies to you folks on the A&E side slash CM side owner's reps. When a claim is submitted that is being denied, the contractor is proceeding under protest and they're going to document every penny that they spend. It is to your benefit, owner's side, if you track those costs and, you, and it's very easily done. And Caltrans and every major agency has their version of a daily extra work report. And yeah, it requires extra effort, but trust me, the contractor's gonna do it or should be doing it. And what the whole purpose of it is, and, I, and I've done a lot of claims work, is that when it comes time for the hearing, well, let, let me, I'll come back to that. Let me, let me finish my last sentence. Because why, why are we doing all this? Well, unfortunately, again, contrary to copy myth among contractors, you don't have an option to not proceed. That's just not the way it works in public works contracts. The option of refusing to proceed without an approved change order, or IE on disputed work, it's not an option under a public works contract policy. Refusing to proceed with the disputed work will put the contractor into a breach of contract position. This is an example of what I'm talking about, that the contract is written in favor of the owner. And trust me, those of you from the owner's side, you have no idea the burden this puts on construction contractors when they have to do the work and then wait months and months and months to get paid for it when their claim is finally uh, judged as having merit. So the, 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 the strategy is that 
when when my when our company has done proceeded with work under protest, we keep those daily extra risk reports because what will happen is that eventually, if our case is good and strong, we will get the change order, and then they'll spend another want to spend another five, three months or ninety days arguing about well, did it really cost you that much? And my point is that if you have a claim that's gonna be judged as having merit, you don't want the cost debated. The cost should be absolutely clear from day one. So when we proceed with, with work under protest, we keep that deal and we send a copy to the owner and we ask them to sign it. There's even a, a dis, there's even a disclaimer on our particular company form that says signature of uh, owner's rep signature does not constitute approval for payment. It's simply an acknowledgement that on this day, this amount of work was done on the disputed work under question. So I, I'm, I'm making a lot of emphasis on this because if you have those daily extra work reports on disputed work, when it comes time to go into the hearing about judging the merit of the claim, the price really shouldn't be a debate. The price is the price is the cost. It's there in black and white. And your inspector signed that we were out there doing that work. It, it eliminates the possibility that the contractor will, will uh, inflate the cost so we, we run into all kinds of owners that say, no, we're not going to sign up your daily extra work report. And, and that's why we added that disclaimer note in the lower left-hand corner that says signature by an owner's rep does not constitute approval and or authority. It just simply says, yes, the contractor was here with this amount of, of uh, resources working on this disputed work. I guess I think I beat that to death, but it is really an important thing for both sides of the fence to understand that the daily extra work report is really a valuable tool. Lastly, as a contractor, you, you have to follow the process and insist on resolution by the owner's rep. Because I, I can tell you from bitter experience, it is all too common occurrence that the owner and or the CM or the designer, they take months to arrive at a decision on whether your claim has merit or should be denied. During that time period, both the GC and the subs involved will not be paid for any costs associated with this disputed work. In the case of the transit center in downtown San Francisco, they're asking for $180 million. Must be good to have, be a company that big that you can carry that kind of that kind of cost. And finally, if you are denied the claim, your only recourse is litigation. Uh, as I said, these construction contracts are not written in favor of the contractor. So for our DBE clients that are subcontractors and prime contractors, but particularly subcontractors, um, this is how the process works. It is the same for BART, for VTA, for Contra Costa County, for Caltrans, you, you name it, they all follow the same type of procedure. The language varies very slightly from owner to owner. So you need to be prepared. Next. I'm going to close with simply saying it's, it, you know, change orders are very seldom a pleasant subject, but in the real world, they are almost always a fact of life. It, it really is a very rare project that proceeds without them. As a contractor, you must be prepared. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you need your know, to know your plans and specs to the maximum degree possible. And there's some little reminders there about what's what's typical for all public works construction contracts. They're open. The bids are open in public. They must be bonded if they're over 25,000 by the prime. 
Any sub with a contract over a half a percent of the prime bid must be listed by the prime. And any such listed sub cannot be substituted out without proper justification. There's a complete process for substituting out a, 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 sub, a listed subcontractor. As I said, they all have a change order procedure language that is very specific. And this one is always is one that is very seldom known by many, many contractors. That the majority of contractors are awarded to the prime. They take at least three to six weeks. We right now, our, my family business, we have a job that we did nine months ago. And it still has a, we haven't been not been given a notice to proceed. Your subcontract for you subs is going to be on the prime standard format, not yours. And it's a rare occasion that if you're a very first time bidder that you're going to get a job your first time out. You got to be competitive bidding for plans and specs. That's a very quick overview, folks. I've done workshops where claims and change orders, we discuss them and go over them in detail. We have an attorney present. They can take two to three hours. Um, there are firms, uh, legal um, legal company, I mean, uh, lawyer firms that uh, they'll charge twenty five hundred dollars for a for a workshop just on claims alone. So it's a very detailed and complex process. But as I said, it's spelled out, and you need to read it. Uh, I'll make one last comment. Uh, people say, well, you know, every 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 contractor loves the change orders. One of the reasons that we don't is that <laughs> I found this out very early in my career. In public works construction contracts, the change order procedure always includes the allowable markup. Now let that sink in. We can't turn in a price whether it's disputed or not, that we can load up and, and make, you know, mark it up 50%, it's prohibited. <clears throat> Excuse me. The markups that are in all the contracts that are out there to, in public works contracts, they're very, um, it's the right word, they're very, uh, they're not generous, let me put it that way. And most most contractors, I think all contractors will tell you, especially the primes, the markup that we get on subcontracts is just not worth it. Now, when you're somebody like Tudor Saliva, again, this is all public knowledge, who gets a fifty million dollar subcontract from the high speed rail, well, fifty million dollars with a five percent markup is a pretty nice chunk of change. So, but we're not all in that league. And when you're doing a change order, that the uh, the total cost of the change order is fifteen thousand dollars or twenty thousand dollars, and and you're allowed to make as a general contractor, you're allowed to make a five percent markup. That barely covers the paperwork. So don't think for one minute that change orders are a lucrative source of income on public works contracts. Because I'm tri I'm telling you. They're not. So, as you can hear the tone of my voice, it's a very sore subject with me because it is something that is um, it's, it's controversial, but it is a fact of life. And I would hope, please, that I see that we have 15 of us on board. Please uh, give me your comments and questions. I, I'd love to hear some of your questions right now. So. That concludes my presentation. <clears throat> um, sorry about that. I just started talking and realized I was on mute too. <laughs> um, but I was just going to say uh, thanks, Ed. And yes, everybody, please chime in with your questions. Um, if you know how to unmute yourself, um, please do that. It's, it's an option in the black menu bar. You'll see a telephone um, icon that says mute. Um, so you, would, you can click on or off that to mute or unmute yourself. So please go ahead and do that or write your questions in the comment section.
Just a second to see if anyone's going to unmute. Um, <laughs> and someone asked a question in the chat box. Uh, they just said, out of curiosity, what is the name of your family's contractor business? It's Aztec, A-Z-T-E-C, Constructors. Just got a couple of thank yous from attendees, but no other questions. Um, so one other option, which maybe a lot of people are looking for, is um, you can always schedule a one-on-one -on -one session with Ed to dive deeper into this. Uh, we just did get one more question. Um, if the <coughs> the sub, who would be in charge to handle it if it goes to court, prime or sub? Um, let me let me ask a question before I before I answer that. If you if you say the dispute is with the subcontractor, um, I assume you're talking I assume you're referring to a subcontractor who's claiming some work and um, and that and it's not the prime who's, who's submitting the, the COR, is that correct? <coughs> They said, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, first of all, as a prime contractor, it is our job to um, stick up for our subs. I've, our firm, as I said, because of the many years we've been doing this, we've had both both cases. We've had it where we know that the sub is submitting a false claim. When we think when we think that's that's the case. What we will do is have a one on one meeting with the with the subcontractor and we'll point out to them, look, it's covered right here in the plans and specs. And so we kill the claim. If we're not if we think there's a possibility, we have an obligation to present the RF the uh, RFI slash claim. We have an obligation to present it to the owner's rep. So that it will be submitted to the owner, and then the owner will judge on on whether that's that's uh, uh, with with merit or not. What happens in real life is that the subcontractor is adamant that I'm entitled to this extra work, and the contractor, having submitted to the owner, gets an adjudication. They get a they get a decision, and the decision is, no, you're not. Well, that means that the only recourse that the, uh, that the sub has is to go to court, and they will sue the owner and the prime. That's just the unfortunate side of this type of, of our business. But if the, uh, if the claim is, is legit, as you said, and the, uh, the uh, owner uh, denies it, the, the only option for the sub is the same option that I have, and that we have to go sue them and try to win our case through mediation, arbitration, or in the worst case, litigation. Um, as I said, it's not a fun process because the, the odds are stacked against the contract. There's, there's, no, there's no whitewashing that. That's just a fact of life. And yes, the... Uh, process for a change order starts with an RFI, always. When you say you understand, but who will handle it, the sub or the prime? The sub will ha handle their own, lo their own uh, lawsuit, but from a standpoint of the submittal to the owner, the prime has to pass through the COR to the owner. And then the owner responds back and says, yes or no. And whatever the decision is, they pass that back down to the sub. All right, a um, couple other questions here. Someone asked, what is the PIN for the Govology website? I don't know it off the top of my head, but we do have a fancy flyer all about it that includes the PIN and instructions on how to log in. So I can send that out with the slides. Um, 
And then another question, someone said, so the process for a CO starts with an RFI first? Question mark. And that is, yes, that is the answer to that is yes. I see the next question is what happens when the prime does not want to pay the sub? Well, the prime not paying a sub can come for a multitude of reasons. Number one, the worst case, the prime's a crook, the prime's a bum, the prime is working with the subcontractor's money. Um, that's an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, there's, again, that puts us back with the attorneys, which is the worst case. But let's put that one aside for the moment and say, what happens when Prime does, does not want to pay the sub? Maybe it's because they haven't been paid, number one. Maybe it's because the pay request from the sub to the contractor, the Prime, is not correct. I see this all the time. And that goes to the bidding process and the contract scope of work process. The invoicing for work complete during the 30 days, the invoice process has to follow the contract process. And I can't tell you how many subs don't read the contract, don't read the general conditions, and they'll come and simply come in and say, okay, I, I, I moved on, I did my work, and here's my bill, I'm 50% complete. Well, they missed the point that the inspector walked the job with the prime and said, oh, okay, so the plumber is over here. Um, and said, yeah, he's here. Uh, he's 25% complete. So when the pay request goes in, the owner is only approving 25% for the, for the plumbing and the plumber submits a bill for 50% of the work. And then when they only get 25%, they complain, well, the process <laughs> calls for an owner has to approve the percentage of work complete or the quantity amount on a unit price basis. They approve that. The prime doesn't approve it. The sub doesn't art, cannot arbitrarily say, I want 50% of my money. It has to be in accordance with the actual work completed. So there's, there's, there's different scenarios as, as to why a prime won't pay a sub. Um, another reason, the invoice is correct. The payment from the owner to the prime is correct. Everything's correct, but the, but the sub haven't turned in their certified payroll. If they haven't turned in the certified payroll, I'm not gonna pay you because that's a requirement in order for me to, to uh, continue to get paid by the owner. That's a contra contractual requirement on every contract. Does that answer your question? All right. So I don't, I'm not seeing any other questions come through, so I think we'll go ahead and end it here. Thank you so much, Ed. That was, um, really informational for me. I hope it was informational for everyone else as well. Um, I'll be sending out an email after this, as I said, with the slides. I'll also include Ed's contact information, including a link where you can schedule a phone session with him directly. Um, and then I'll attach uh, our flyer with instructions how to log into the Gavology website. All right, thank you everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Taylor.